Mexi. Welcome one and all to the most heartening news you will hear all month. Workers the world over have been standing up and fighting back, and today we take a moment to celebrate the glorious wins they've been able to achieve. Workers in France's 14th districts of Marseille have seized a closed McDonald's building and are running a food bank. In December of 2019, the McDonald's was on the verge of shuttering, so workers took the keys and occupied it. When the COVID pandemic struck, the building became a hub of aid distribution. After being shut for a year, the building has never been busier. Workers rearranged the logo to read L'Après M or After M and are serving hundreds of people each day. In a surprise move, the left-wing leadership in Marseille agreed to buy the building and legalize the food serve, preventing its closure by police. This kind of community organization and mutual aid is beautiful to see. Rank and file electricians in the UK, who had been engaged in months of direct action against construction firms Balfour Beatty and NG Bailey, have successfully forced the companies to abandon their plans to de skill the electrical trade. The companies had planned to introduce the electrical support operative grade at the Hinkley Point C nuclear reactor, which would have allowed workers without full training to carry out vital electrical work, which workers said could lead to a nuclear greenfell. The move to de-skill the trade would allow the companies to pay workers less and cut jobs. Not about to let that happen, workers united and blockaded the Hinkley Point site itself, occupied the offices of companies that held contracts with Balfour and Bailey, and then shut down work at an atomic weapons establishment site. Despite anti-union laws, workers' persistent pressure eventually drove the companies to abandon their de-skilling agenda. The JIB Electrician Twitter account said rank and file sparks have once again fought back and defeated the attempted de-skilling of the electrical trade. NG Bailey and Balfour Beatty, get back in your box and take your de-skilling agenda with you. Direct action works. After over two years of bargaining with Condé Nast and a major protest outside the home of Anna Winter, where protesters shouted, bosses wear Prada, workers get nada. The New Yorker union has averted a strike by reaching an agreement in principle on their first contracts. Their sustained collective pressure won them wage increases of at least 10% for most members and up to 63% for some. As well, a salary floor of $55,000, which will increase to $60,000 by 2023, and guaranteed annual raises of 2% to 2.5%, increasing over the life of the contract. These wins are among many others pertaining to job security, benefits, diversity and inclusion, and workplace safety, including a ban on NDAs in cases of workplace discrimination or harassment. Fantastic. Housing activists in Seattle, with support in municipal government from the Socialist City Council member Shama Sawant, are seeing results from their collective action with the passing of three bills that will help some of the city's vulnerable people stay in their homes. The first bill will defend students and school employees from eviction during the school year, including evictions from missed rent. The second bill will require landlords to offer lease renewals to tenants before existing leases expire and before seeking new tenants. The third bill curtails the impending wave of post-pandemic evictions by banning evictions based on rent debts accrued during the pandemic. Sawant, who sponsored or co-sponsored each bill, said of them, Today's bills put people before profits. They put the rights of renters above the interests of corporate landlords. They prioritize housing stability instead of racist gentrification. Hell yeah, Shama. Innovation from the left? Who would have thunk it? An amazing listener, Taylor Alexander, sent in their innovative project Acorn, which is an open source precision farming rover. The rover can be equipped for a variety of farm tasks, including weed picking and vegetable harvesting, and is powered by solar panels. Taylor's goal with the project is to grow food to feed those in need in the San Francisco Bay Area and help people the world over do the same for their communities. In the long term, they hope to build automation for future post-capitalist, socialist, or communist societies. Acorn will farm in a way that heals the soil and promotes healthy ecosystems. They hope their machine can replace heavy diesel burning tractors which use increasingly abusive business models, but say that we still need other leftists to fight for ecological production of parts like solar panels. Really cool project and the kind of solar punk visioning that we need. Cuba and Mexico have committed to open licensing their domestically developed COVID vaccines, and Venezuela has proposed creating a tech sharing platform that could run in parallel with the World Health Organization's technology access pool. These commitments were expressed at the conclusion of the Summit for Vaccine Internationalism led by countries from the Global South. Organizers described the event as in polar opposite to the G7 leaders meeting in early June. 
the World Health Organization appeal to the G7 leaders to help vaccinate 70% of the world's population by mid-2022, but their dose-sharing commitments would reach only 10% of the global population, an absolute travesty. The summit was largely led by officials in middle-income countries, particularly ministers from Latin American countries who committed to openly collaborate on COVID-19 vaccine technology, provide regulatory capacity support to countries in need, and pool manufacturing capacity for the production of vaccines and other medical equipment such as personal protective equipment and oxygen. Cuba and Mexico offered to collaborate on vaccine trials and open licensing for other countries to be able to produce their domestically developed vaccines such as Cuba's Soberana II and Mexico's Patria. It is criminal that the G7 leaders are not doing their part, but fantastic to see such solidarity among countries in the global south. On June 6th, which was election day in Mexico, more than 20 indigenous towns in Michoacan decided to expel political parties and become autonomous, managing resources on their own. They followed several other communities like Angajuan, who made the same decision in late May. The indigenous Otomi community living in Mexico City also demonstrated against the electoral process, saying our dreams do not fit in your ballot boxes. I echo voices in movement when I say solidarity to communities that have chosen indigenous self-determination and are moving to kick out the politicians. Indigenous students at the formerly named Ryerson University in Takaranto, which is the true Anishinaabe name for Toronto, have spent decades raising awareness, organizing, and petitioning the administration to remove the statue of Egerton Ryerson and change the name of the university as Ryerson was a key architect in the horrifying residential school system. Getting nowhere with the school's administration, on June 6th, students took matters into their own hands and toppled the monument to Canadian white supremacy themselves, and people were elated. This action was a long time coming, but it was set off by the discovery of the bodies of 215 Indigenous children at the site of a former residential school in the Kamloops de Sequepem First Nations Territory, so-called Kamloops, BC. The statue's severed head was purified in Lake Ontario and then covertly delivered to 1492 Landback Lane, which is an indigenous protest encampment that was established by Six Nations land defenders to stop a corporate housing development project that directly violates the sovereignty of the Haudenosaunee. And when Six Nations wins, this asshole will be there to see it. And after hearing recommendations from First Nations, the City Council of Charlatan Prince Edward Island voted to remove the city statue of John A. Macdonald. Canada's first prime minister and known colonial monster who played a pivotal role in setting up the residential school system and also cleared the prairies for European settlement by intentionally starving and detaining indigenous peoples, created the RCMP to police indigenous people, instituted the Chinese head tax. I mean, I could go on and on. Councillor Greg Rivard said, I see some comments on social media saying you can't erase history, but I don't think removing a statue erases any history. A statue is symbolic of something, and I don't think right now that the statue is symbolic of the right things. While tearing down statues is merely symbolic, these symbols do carry so much power. If they didn't, no one would object to them being removed. It is fantastic to see people across this country increasingly reject the colonial myth of Canada and recognize it as Turtle Island, which we also see every July 1st, which is so-called Canada Day, but has become Indigenous People's Day, as more and more people refuse to celebrate colonialism and white supremacy. I see this important consciousness raising as a crucial first step in building a mass movement for full decolonization. The Public Prosecution Service will not be prosecuting 14 people who attended Black Lives Matter protests in front of Belfast City Hall last June. About 500 people attended that BLM demonstration in Londonderry, and police alleged that they were breaking COVID-19 guidelines. But after facing subsequent public pushback against the prosecutions, they have all been dropped. The PPS said those involved would have a reasonable excuse for their defense, as the protests related to a matter of important social concern, were peaceful, and were organized in a manner to minimize any risk of transmitting the virus. The demonstrations were organized by local BIPOC activists and their allies, including the Belfast People Before Profit branch, a local united front with a Marxist member of Legislative Assembly, and three city councillors in Belfast. I bring up Belfast People Before Profit because their tireless work also got a motion passed in Belfast City Council condemning Israel. Fantastic and ties nicely into our next story. Workers are keeping pressure up against the Israeli occupation. Last month, we reported that unionized dock workers in Italy and South Africa refused to load and offload Israeli ships owned by the Israeli state-owned company Zim Lines. 
This month, after two blockades which were supported by ILW Local 10, AROC activists successfully turned away the apartheid profiteering Zim lines from the port of Oakland. AROC and ILW Local 10 blocked Zim in 2014 as well, the year of the Great March of Return, and they have yet to successfully return. This fantastic showing of working class solidarity was part of the continuation of an international week of action meant to ensure that Zim is turned away everywhere. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. This story was sent in by an activist in Japan where there is currently a severe refugee and immigration detention system which has led to serious human rights violations and even death. After proposing revisions to the law that would have made it even harder for people to gain refugee status in Japan, activists, human rights organizations, and Japanese immigration lawyers began protesting against this together with people trying to apply for refugee status, and they have recently been holding regular sit-ins in front of the Diet Building. The protest resulted in the Japanese government dropping the immigration law revision for now. It's not yet clear what the next step will be, but this is a small important win, which shows that protesting and voicing your opinion can make a change, which Madeline says is something not many Japanese Japanese people think, which is one of the reasons why participation in protests here is generally quite low. Solidarity with all activists trying to make change for refugee rights in Japan. The Indian state of Tamil Nadu is about to become the first in the country to ban conversion therapy. Justice Venkatesh of the Madras High Court said that the LGBTQ community is entitled to their privacy and have a right to lead a dignified existence which includes their choice of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender presentation, gender expression, and choice of partner thereof. At the same time, the National Medical Commission was asked to revoke the licenses of all doctors who practice any kind of conversion therapy. The court order also states that cops and officials shall not interfere in the lives of queer folks. This marks a huge step forward for LGBT rights in India. The Department of Justice filed court documents this month against recently passed laws in Arkansas and West Virginia restricting transgender rights, saying they are unconstitutional. The legal briefs argue that the state laws violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution's 14th Amendment. The Arkansas law was said to be a dangerous governmental intrusion, as one of the provisions prevents doctors from performing gender reassignment surgeries. The DOJ also stood strongly against West Virginia's law regarding transgender girls participating in youth sports. The brief states, the United States has a significant interest in ensuring that all students, including students who are transgender, can participate in an educational environment free of unlawful discrimination. Let's hope these unconstitutional laws are shot down in court. On Saturday, June 26th, Transor Nu, or Transcare Now, organized a demonstration in Amsterdam against the miserable state of transgender healthcare and for a structurally different system of transition care based on self-determination and decentralization. The event drew hundreds of trans people and their allies and was the first ever demonstration fighting explicitly for trans rights in the country. In the Netherlands, transition care is extremely slow and humiliating where trans people are forced to comply with doctors' outdated images of what a trans person is. Transor Nu and allies demand no more waiting lists, no more gatekeeping processes for diagnosis but rather self-determination, to decentralize trans care and break the monopoly, and to put transgender care in transgender hands. The organization said the demo has kicked off the trans summer of rage, introducing further actions by the group and encouraging others to organize themselves and fight for dignified trans health care in the Netherlands. Slovenia has become the 13th country in Europe to update their laws to define rape as sex with Without consent. The change comes as a result of years of organizing and campaigning by survivors and women's organizations. Until now, the Slovenian criminal code required evidence of use of force or the threat of use of force and violence to classify an act as a rape. The European director at Amnesty International, an organization that helped push this change, said of the victory, there is still a great deal of work to be done to challenge the deep-seated attitudes to rape and harmful gender stereotypes, but today we take a moment to celebrate. In Peru, with 100% of the votes counted, the Free Peru Party has an advantage of 44,000 votes, and Pedro Castillo, the son of illiterate Andean peasants, is poised to become the next Peruvian president. The party openly opposes neoliberalism and seeks to rescue the minimized, almost imperceptible and dying state from the subjugation of market dictatorship. The prospect of working class politics coming to the fore in the former colonial state has shaken Peru's elite who benefit from entrenched inequality. Castillo's rival, Taiko Fujimori, 
is none other than the daughter of former Peruvian right-wing dictator Alberto Fujimori, who solidified his power in 1992 with a military coup and ruled the country with an iron fist until the year 2000. Kaiko Fujimori has embraced the same racist and classist rhetoric of her father in order to discredit the election, challenging 500,000 votes mostly cast by poor Andeans and calling for them to be annulled. As the election process is finalized, it is likely that Castillo will emerge the victor despite the attempts of the elite to undermine the election. We must note though that although the Free Peru Party is economically leftist, because of the powerful influence of Catholicism in the peasantry, the party takes reactionary positions towards social issues such as abortion and LGBTQ rights. This is unacceptable, so solidarity with activists in Peru fighting for a more transformative change. Political newcomer India Walton defeated the four-time Buffalo mayor Byron Brown to become not only the city's first woman mayor, but first open socialist. Brown, who the Democratic establishment believed was a shoe in ran a passive campaign and avoided debates, which is too bad because then he may have been able to learn from Walton why he lost. Brown, who spent his career focused on major developers and the police union, did little to help the mostly racialized working class communities in Buffalo. Walton said in an interview earlier this month, the mayor has been in office for 16 years, and we have not seen significant improvements in many of our communities, especially those that are primarily occupied by black people and brown people and poor people. Walton campaigned on an extensive platform that included strengthening protections for renters, removing cops from responding to mental health crises, ending enforcement of low-level drug possession, declaring Buffalo a sanctuary city that will not cooperate with ICE, and convening community leaders to create the city's first climate action program. After years of heroic resistance by indigenous land defenders and their allies, TC Energy, the Canadian company behind the Keystone XL project, has announced that it is pulling the plug on the pipeline. The company said that it would coordinate with regulators, stakeholders, and indigenous groups to ensure a safe exit from the project. The termination of the Keystone XL ends more than a decade of resistance and marks a monumental win for indigenous peoples who rightfully maintained that not only did the project threaten the integrity of their territories and sovereignty, but would only worsen the climate crisis. The end of the project sets a fantastic precedent and will add to the pressure on the Canadian and US governments to terminate other projects, including Line 3 and the Dakota Access Pipeline. After this victory, the Indigenous Environmental Network said, after more than 10 years of organizing, we have finally defeated an oil giant. Keystone XL is dead. We stood hand in hand to protect the next seven generations of life, the water, and our communities from this dirty tar sands pipeline. In a major victory for animal rights, Estonia has become the first Baltic state to ban fur farming. The Rigi Gohu amended the Animal Protection Act and the Nature Conservation Act to prohibit breeding and keeping of animals solely or mainly for the purpose of harvesting fur. The amending bill establishes a transitional period that will come into full force on January 1st, 2026. Annalisa Post, head of the communications and member of the management board of animal welfare organization Loomis, said of the victory, With this decision, we are setting an example both for neighboring countries and in the wider world. No animal should suffer for human vanity, and we are grateful to the members of the Rigi Gohu for making an animal-friendly decision. Estonia has now joined 14 other European states which have enacted similar bans. With the ongoing work of animal rights activists, this number will continue to grow. A Bornean owl thought to be extinct has been documented in the wild for the first time since 1892. Published in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology, ecologist Andy Boist reported the rediscovery and photographed the owl in the forests of Mount Kinabalu in Sabah, Malaysia. Almost all data on the subspecies of Rajaskop's owl is totally unknown. Though the Rajaskops is designated as a species of least concern by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, further study of the Bornean subspecies might lead ornithologists to conclude that the owl is its own species. This could have important conservation implications towards both subspecies of owls, given each would be an island endemic species. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to veganvanguardpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. Thank you also to our wonderful patrons. If you would like to become a sustaining member, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news. You can also give us a one-time dip via PayPal below. We like to have those good news. Yeah. Come on, sometimes. sometimes.